Hey up! And uh, welcome to a Yorkshire Gamers, a Reap Big War Games podcast, and episode eight. And uh, this is being recorded on the evening of the 11th of June 2021 uh, for release tomorrow. And uh, apologies to everyone, um, my normal two week schedule uh, this episode is just going to be a day late. Uh, unfortunately, I had a, a wonderful time away last week uh, on a course with work, uh, which has just left me a little bit behind. And uh, very soon we'll go over to today's episode with uh, Simon Hall, um, the writer of Fields of Glory and Mortimer Glorium. And a lovely long chat with Simon, ch- cracking bloke, and a uh, really nice chat on plenty of things, big games and all the rules he's written, and um, all the games that he plays down in South Africa. So we have most definitely gone south of Sheffield again, and it was lovely to speak to somebody uh, in a, another continent and uh, talk about the war gaming scene there. And it's uh, something that I hope to do um, over coming episodes is, is reach out to people uh, in different areas of the world and uh, get a, a feeling for how the hobby is uh, over there. Just before we begin, uh, there was a few sound issues uh, with the recording. Um, unfortunately, the, the the line to South Africa was a little bit um, uh, blurry and occasion um, the recording of Simon's voice was quite low. So I've had to do some amplification in places so the, the levels do go up and down a bit. But I've tried to make it as, uh, as best I can. I'm, as I've said many times on here before, I'm not a sound engineer and, and I hope that the uh, the quality uh, doesn't spoil your enjoyment because uh, it certainly was a lovely chat. So uh, with no more ado, let's get over and listen to my interview with Simon. Hello everyone and welcome to Yorkshire Gamers, a Reap Big War Games podcast. And would you believe it, we've made to episode eight without being sued by anyone. So that's uh, that's a, that's a, a result for my books. And uh, for, for today's guest, uh, we've gone over to the dark side. We've uh, we've got somebody in from, from that place over the hill. And uh, he's a former World War Games oh, champion. <laughs> <laughs> and an author of a number of sets of war games rules and he's coming to us today live from another continent uh, from south africa would you believe this lad is most definitely south of sheffield um our guest has come through the fields of glory and is now the king of purple from the mean streets of burnley to the coasts of cape town he's come to join us here today in a very sunny yorkshire So let's give a huge white rose welcome to Simon Hall. Hello, Simon. (laughs) Hello, what an introduction. So my my objective for this session is to make sure you get through nine podcasts without being seen by anybody. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure sure we've come close on a couple of (laughs) occasions. Well, it's the nature of things. (laughs) It it, it is, it is. Great to be with you, of course. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we had a little chat before we started, and um, I know you've done a couple of podcasts before, haven't you? So uh, you, you, you kind of know what we're doing. Uh, we, we say that, and it'll all go horribly wrong now, won't it? That's part of it, though, isn't it? <laughs> we, meander, we meander where we go. That's part of the fun of the podcast. So. Well, so, well, uh, well, Simon, I've got absolutely loads on my list to talk about. Um, I, uh, we've got rules, we've got big games, we've got Mortimer Glorium, we've got Divisions of Steel, loads of sorts of stuff to, to talk about. But the first section of the podcast, I like to just concentrate on you yourself and you as a gamer. And uh, the first thing we do um, is a little thing called the four minute challenge. And um, rather than you going on for hours about your background <laughs> which happens sometimes yeah. um i like to get people to try and summarize in four minutes or less um what they what they've done in their in their war game in lives uh, and bring us up to date if possible and um at the end of the four minutes you'll hear the countdown music the theme at the end of the 30 <laughs> seconds um and then if you go too far you'll hear D.I. Regan from the Sweeney telling you to shut it. So, oh, wow. 
I might have to just overrun a few seconds just to get that. No worries. <laughs> Shut okay. it. Shut it. <laughs> right then, Simon. So, uh, so three, two, one, off you go. Well, really, my, my war gaming goes in four phases. I had my Burnley era as I was growing up. Um, and started off really from a, an article in Battle Magazine playing World War II uh, with a good friend, Mark Bevis, kept going there. And then we really lived through the year of the Bruce Quarry rules of mm. um, time battles in miniature and the Napoleonic set that he wrote. Played those a lot through my youth and then played the early WYG set starting with 4th and 5th edition um, and got hooked on part of Burnley and Pendle War Games Club. And up in the north where you and I killed from, Peter yep. Gilder was hanging around quite a bit in that era. So we yeah, got to see him a fair bit. And that was quite inspiring in that sort of era. Um, and then after, a, after about 10 years of work where I only did the occasional war game with friends, because work life took over for a bit when mm. I moved down to London, I decided to get going again and joined Rygate War Games Club, which actually is a very competition-oriented war games club, actually. Mm. So I had little uh, option, really. If I was going to play there, you may as well join in what they're doing. So I did my first competitions, having always thought these things are going to be difficult and not much fun. Turned out they were great fun. Um, so I played there all the way through the ancient DBM era. Um, and as you say, I, I managed to win the World Championship three times in, in three different places in the 2000 to 2004 year and win lots of competitions. And it was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, my other highlight of the year even then was to do a reenactment game every Christmas. So we had a big game every Christmas using those rules. Um, they never really worked. So we'll come back to that later <laughs> when we talk about it. I think, uh, I think 12 out of 12 in terms of the not working very well. But hey, it was fun. Um, and then I got um, drawn into the team to write Fog, Feel the Glory. So we did Feel the Glory with Osprey, the brief for which was to have something fairly evolutionary, which proved pretty successful. I mean, it got a lot of attention. It probably up, up the, um, the stakes in terms of standards of books and such things mm. as well. So that, that took off pretty well and had its, had its era. And I played that, obviously, while that was live. Um, and then thereafter, coming to South Africa, just before I, I did that, I published... Meg on my own as a new invention, wanted to, wanted to think about something new. I've been a game inventor since I was young, really. Me and my brother used to invent games, published a couple of board games on the side. So I came up with the idea of the colour system, which was quite distinctive, and it started to prove that it really worked well for war games. So I self-published that back in 2016. People liked it, so I got PSE to pick it up and publish it properly, if I can put it that way. Yep. <laughs> um, beginning of 2020, which, which unfortunately slammed dumped you into COVID. So we managed to launch it just at the COVID time, which has not been altogether easy. But despite that, it's really kicked off and been picked up all over the world, and people are really enjoying playing it. And my big favourite things are historical refights, big games and campaigns, actually, if, I, if I'm to choose the things I really like doing. So we, we do a lot of big games down here that we'll come back to. Lots yeah. of 28 mil figures, like one ball with six players aside. That's, that's probably my favourite type of war game, actually, if I was to do any type of war gaming. Yeah. And so we try and do a fair bit of that down here. And hopefully I'm just about to get the Sweeney. You have. Well done. Uh, we're on about three minutes 20. So... Uh, oh, not you, bad. So I can walk for another 40 seconds to get the Sweeney in. Uh, yeah, well, I can fast forward <laughs> it. I think you need to give me the Sweeney because it's one of my favourite all time programmes. So I think I've just got to be able to see it. I'll just keep waffling and you can press it while I'm talking. And that way it sounds more. <laughs> can you hear the countdown music in the background? Uh, I can. I can hear the countdown music in the background. There we go. I'll tell you what, I'll keep waffling so you can go. So the other thing is, I've been a big figure collector over the years. So I've sit here. <laughs> About 50, about 50, figures, I think, in the room here. I think you've so. waffled over him. <laughs> oh, I missed him. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get him back. I'll see if I can get him back. Get him back, get him back. right? So. No, shut him. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a the theme music running around my head. Fantastic. Oh, brilliant. brilliant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is, I think there's a little bit of a delay on the line between us and, and South Africa. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. I've, I, I had a worse <laughs> connection to my friend who lives uh, just outside Bradford, uh, who runs a War Games holiday centre. So, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm quite impressed that this is, we're getting it reasonably good to South Africa. We're doing okay, aren't we? 
doing it. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for that, uh, Simon. That's absolutely brilliant. And um, you mentioned a few clubs uh, during that. Are you in a club now in South Africa? Yeah, we we have the um, Western Province War Games Association here in Cape Town. So we we when there's no COVID around, we we meet every Thursday night here, and then one Saturday every month do a big game. So we deliberately do one big game a month. Yeah, so it's an all day. The day event. Um, so yeah, so I'm a, I'm a member of that, and I, I I play there. I've got a nice little war game centre nearby in the town here that I can go down to and play at as well, called the Warren um, in Somerset West, which is a nice place run by a chap called Warren, unsurprisingly. Um, <laughs> and then I had obviously Burnley and Pendle War Games Club and, and Raggett War Games Club, and I used to play a fair bit at Farnborough as well. But friends only farm used to go down to there quite a bit. So uh, this uh, this this podcast has been fairly UK centric so far. Uh, we've wandered over the borders into Wales and, and Scotland on occasion, uh, but we've never been as far as South Africa. Uh, so what, what's the just describe the war game scene in South Africa? What's is it is it expats or, or what's it like? No, no, it's uh, actually um, back in the DBM days. We they hosted the World Championship a few times here. The oh, right. was, was organised in South Africa. So I won it in Durban, I think, in 2002. Um, and so there are probably a good 40 players here in South Africa. We, South Africa is an interesting place for geography. Because you've got Joburg, Durban, Cape Town, there's three big centres, but they're miles apart. So yeah. it's really just flights to get together. But, but we have a pretty active group, about 20 people here. Uh, there's about 60 MEG players now mm. locally here. Um, what's nice about that is... Um, Probably only, I think only four of them were really committed ancient players. War games before me, which is yeah. quite nice. You know, we've drawn people from other other things, and a few of them were pure sci-fi gamers. Mm. So that's quite helpful. So yeah, it's you, pretty vibrant, I think. Small numbers were pretty vibrant. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned you mentioned a shop in Cape Town as well. So that the, there's obviously numbers to keep that open. There's three. Yeah, there's three decent shops. There's the Warren here near me. There's uh, Pandemonium games and there's boards and swords on either side of Cape Town. So we've got we've got three places here that, that stock stuff for gaming. So you know even the historical game got a reasonable number of players if you extend it out to all of the sci-fi games workshop type stuff, then obviously mm. the numbers are a lot more. Um, but no, it's a reasonably reasonably thriving little community. And we and at the moment we seem to be gaining people quite a bit. We get a couple of new people every few months joining so no oh, that's fantastic that really is good um what's it do you know what it's like through the rest of the country that are the clubs in joburg and, and durban uh, and uh, i know the one in there's a big one in joburg and there's one in port elizabeth i don't think there's one in durban I think that's, yeah that's the one that hasn't got one. so there's about there's three main clubs i'm aware of uh, and, we, yeah. just before it all went pear shaped with flight we were actually planning an event at the castle here in cape town we're going to host a mega event there and people are going to come in from Port Elizabeth and Joburg. So we'd have gathered probably about 24 to, to 30 players, I think, for a mega event in Cape Town, which would be pretty cool. Brilliant. And um, are there any are there any conventions other than other than the one you've just mentioned? Are there any shows or anything? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a game show at the university here. Yeah. The, uh, um, which we've been to a couple of times put on demonstration games. Uh, and there's an equivalent one up in Joburg. Yeah. So there's two. They're not they're not big events like Salute or anything. They're they're smaller gatherings. Yeah. Um, but they exist. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's nice. It's nice to it's nice to hear that um, it's uh, there is a like you say a thriving community. And if you if a city's got three game stores, then that's that's a positive sign, isn't it? Because there's enough yeah, no, people to keep them it, going. It is, and there's a and there's a lot of interesting um, South African military history. Actually, if you look back to to work on as well so quite a few of them are quite interested in some of the bits of the past here or the south african organization of world war ii is a very popular topic for a lot of them you know the, the south african divisions in north africa and yeah so the topical interest from those sort of things as well so yeah no they're a great bunch of guys they're really good fun That's fantastic so, so you've, you've landed in the right place i have yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, how, how did a, how did a lad from the main streets of burnley end up in cape town then Oh, that was, uh, yeah, well, I, I did my career as a, um, I was an advisor to boards, really, to, as a strategy consultant, what to do with businesses and organisations. And when I was working in London, there was an opportunity came up to help set up an oil company in South Africa. Mm. Uh, they wanted to buy up some oil companies, a mixed South African oil company. 
Um, and I stuck my hand up to do that because I'm a little adventure. So oh, it's an interesting place to go and see. So I came down to Cape Town to run a project for six months and fell in love with it. Basically, so I thought this is just the most amazing place. So I've had connections with it ever since. That was back in 1992. So I kept my connections with that and used to come back for holidays quite a bit. So when it came to moving away from London, um, we were going to move to the Midlands and uh, somewhere around Birmingham sort of area, so we're quite central to the country. And then we're down here at Christmas and Magdalene said to me, I'm not sure I want to move to the Midlands, but I wouldn't mind moving here. What do you think? So I was kind of blown away. Like, oh, well, my favourite place on earth in terms of where I've been. So then I've travelled a fair bit. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a go from that point of view. Let's have a look round. And uh, we basically put an offering on our house before we came back from holiday. So it was ridiculous, really. Oh, fantastic. well, uh, no, no offence to anybody listening from the black country and around Birmingham, but Birmingham or Cape Town? I know, I, I'm, quite, I'm quite fond of the Birmingham area, but not as much as here, I have to say, bless you all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, yeah. it's a very spectacular place here. I mean, everybody, if you've never visited and get the chance, come, because it's, uh, it's a magnificent place. The culture is wonderful. Um, it, it's actually very, very safe. People worry mm. about some of the stats, but they're all in they're all in certain areas. It's very exaggerated because of that. But you come here and, and just be sensible. It's a beautiful place to visit. The people are lovely. The climate's lovely. Uh, it's north south travel, and once you get here, it's pretty inexpensive. You know, it's just a flight yeah. to get you here. But after that, meals are half the price of the UK and twice as good in general, except for certain dishes that you can only get in the UK. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, uh, we, 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 we had a, during our pre, pre, pre-recording pre chat, I mentioned I'd lived in South Africa for six months uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, Ramfontaine, yeah, and uh, I have to say I absolutely love the place, uh, absolutely fantastic, uh, and uh, recommend it as a visit for everyone, absolutely, absolutely beautiful country, really, really nice. Um, so, um Simon Hall has had quite a long career in wargaming, and I think I heard on one of your podcasts that you you reckon you got about sixty thousand figures. I think you said on one of them. Does yeah, that? Not counting, yeah, not counting six millimeter figures. Oh, all right, right, not counting six mil. But, uh, but yeah, probably between fifty and sixty thousand. I think in total. My word. Are they are they, are they spread around you at uh, home? Uh, most of them are in this room. This is the Antarctic for my war game room. So either side of me here, it's all stacked up to the ceiling with boxes. Oh, and everything, my word. Everything on the war games table is stacked full of boxes. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've, I've had this habit of, um, of, I painted quite a lot when I was young. And then I, and then I thought, well, I'll just, I'll just slowly buy a few things. I'll get another army here and there. Yeah. But I've never really sold anything. I'm not yeah. really a seller. So I've given a few away. I've given to my old ones away this year to get people going ancient war gaming but um i've never really sold anything so i accumulate all this stuff and i'm one of those people who always say oh, you know that world war one army friend that i bought i'll buy it because it'll be useful one day when i get around to doing some world war one <laughs> <laughs> and then it sits down you look at it for 10 years and think well the figures are nice <laughs> yeah so, well, yeah, yeah, you're definitely you're definitely on the right podcast for that sort of uh, volume of figures. We're uh, we don't I, do looking at all your pickies, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we don't do a lot of we don't do a lot of skirmish game in here, <laughs> to, to be honest. No, I, no, not do I. I'm a, more a big battle game, really. So yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. If you if you had to choose then from all the all the stuff you've got, you um because I think you've I think you've got. A wide range of stuff. I mean, obviously, if we're looking just Meg, we've got sort of ancient through to medi- late medieval, early Renaissance, and then um, your, your World War Two set. Obviously, World War Two. Um, those figure ranges do they cover everything? And if so, what's your favourite period? If you can come up with one. Oh, that's that's that's, that's like asking somebody for a heart. I think which 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 three hearts do you want removing? <laughs> You know, I, I couldn't say I have a favourite because I flipped between them. I, I My original favourite probably was Napoleonic because I was really interested in Napoleonic history yeah. when I was a kid. Um, uh, and then it became Asians and it flitted back to World War Two, and then it flitted back to... Asians. So th- those three are like the three, co- three corners of the triangle and everything works around those. It's probably yeah. more within those I have sort of favourite armies. So I've always been a, um, in the ancient period and my biggest interests were always Byzantium and feudal Japan are probably my two biggest interests there. 
Um, so I've got and then the Punic Wars. So those are my three there. So I'm Alexander and Persians. Mm. Uh, and in the Napoleonic era, I was always for some reason a fan of Prussians. So that's stuff. So that's probably Prussians and Brunswick are probably my favourite stuff there. Yeah. Uh, and then um, and then the the World World War Two stuff. I suppose I always had a soft spot for the Russians. So, so a big wide selection throughout history then. Yeah, I've got I've got all of those filled in and then in between I've got quite a lot of Renaissance stuff and Seven mm. Years War stuff. Um I just said World War One stuff, colonial. <laughs> so I've, got, colonial I've got a lot of Zulu guys. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of Zulu around here. So yeah. So yeah, I've covered pretty much all of it. I've never done a huge amount of sci fi stuff or um fantasy gaming stuff from that point of view. I mainly do historical stuff. But I don't mind yeah, I don't have any objection to it. I'm glad we play it. Yeah, do any of it really. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, one thing I talk to people about in this section is what I call the Venn diagram of wargaming. Um, are you familiar with Venn diagrams? Most people are. I am, yeah. Brilliant. I'm on I am familiar with them. Yeah. Excellent. Well, if I think it I think it defines sort of people's gaming personalities and and um, how they're drawn to different parts of the hobby because it is a, a huge thing um, with so many different aspects involved from modeling to painting etc and the four areas I've brought four little subsections I've broken it down into are war gamer painter collector and historian um, so for yourself how do they how do they fit together uh, I think they're a very good four I, I'm a I'm a war gamer historian Probably, mainly. Mainly. So I'm probably, I'm probably, uh, probably 40, 40 war gamer, 30 historian. If I get yep. 100 points, that's probably yeah. hands out. 20, 20 collector, 10 painter. Right, okay. For me. And, I, I, and the giant question has occurred just because of opportunity. So it's just that. I was going to say, I, I did I'm, well. I'm going, to have to, it, so. I'm going to have to challenge the collection challenge thing like, when you've got 60,000 figures. I know, yeah, yeah. And, and, hey, hey, just think what it would look like if I'd have been 40% collector. <laughs> <laughs> Enormous, you know. But, but, but the truth is I'm a, I'm a war game of history com combination, really, more than anything else. Yeah. Um, I enjoy therapeutic painting and modelling, but I can live without it. It's not what drives me or yeah. to do any of it. The collecting stems from the other two. The reason for the yeah. big collection is I like lots of history and yeah. lots of different eras of wargaming. So yeah. it's not difficult to end up with all the stuff. You know, it's not like I'm focused on World War Two wargaming. Yeah, we have you know, a couple of these periods and multiple scales and stuff. Mm. So. so, do you paint all your own stuff then, or do you buy stuff in? Well, I no, I have a, I, I have, over the years I probably I probably painted a, a fifth of them. I would say probably yeah. about ten thousand. So it was a small number. That's a reasonable amount. Uh, the rest. Yeah, the rest I probably picked up at bringing buys or friends who painted armies who aren't like me who tend to paint them, sell them, and do another one. I'm usually the I'm usually the mug on the other end of you when they say, "Do you want to buy all these Ottomans that I've had painted up for for, for this?" And I go, "It's a lot there." Okay, <laughs> we'll keep them in the family. Uh, and then uh, and then had some you know had some professionally painted up here and there as well for various things. So it's yeah. a mix of different stuff. But yeah, I probably painted about ten thousand, I think, and I still paint some yeah. each uh, each year but um my opportunity is a bit more limited with the focus i've got on building the rules and working the rules which takes a sure. lot of time so uh, i've not much chance really no worries um we're going to talk about uh, meg later on um but i just wanted to have a quick chat with you about fields of glory which you mentioned in your um uh introduction there and um how did you get involved in that because it, it, it's it the, the, you did, there wasn't anything else in your introduction that kind of said, "I'm I'm just about to publish this major set of rules with a glossy book." No, it, was, um, it was there was more evolution to it than it first appears because we had all the ancient wargaming going on at the time, and I, I took on one of the lead responsibilities of umpiring clarification, so writing mm. all the clarity. Um, and then you had the British Historical Game Society used to run quite a few things, and at one point there was a sort of um, accidental collision almost of me going to the BHGS saying I've been working on a set of wargame rules for ancients mm. and I wonder if that's in the BHGS would be interested. At the same time the BHGS had been talking to Osprey about publishing a set of wargame. Ah right, so right place, right time. 
So at which point it was kind of, well, why don't you why don't you bring what ideas you've got into this and become one of a team of three to publish a set with Osprey, which will have all the publicity and everything behind it. So it fell into place that way. So it was it was then myself and t- uh, Terry Shaw, who was a my wargaming doubles partner in the, um, in Rygate. Therein lies a funny story. I'll come back to in a minute. And Richard Bodley Scott. So we teamed yeah. up and did that as a team of three with Southern, which was um, Southern Games and Osprey. So it came about really because of that, really. So it was a, mm. it was a collision of things working on a set. And, and about two thirds of what I was working on became part of Fog. And then Terry and Richard brought other ideas and all sort of mixed in. Mm. And uh, became, a, became a, a good end result for the for, the, for its time, really, I think. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a step back to a few things. And Terry, Terry's interesting because I, I played with Terry. <laughs> this made me laugh. But we met in Rygate. We teamed up to play doubles. We played with each other for about three years, I think, before we sort of sat down and he said, you know, we've got quite similar accents, haven't we? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so where, where are you from? I went, I'm from Burnley. <laughs> <laughs> where do you go to school? Burnley Grammar School. Oh, so did I. Where were you born? We were born a mile apart. Oh, my God. We've been playing for three years together. <laughs> doing war gaming. Kind of never quite registered. Never quite registered for a minute that we were from the same area. Never mind the same town or the same sub district with the <laughs> Oh, that's like, brilliant. It was like, we really should have talked more about things other than just war games. <laughs> 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 we have to go for weekends, drink beer, sit with each other for hours and never touch any subject other than war gaming. <laughs> well, you've got to have dedication if you're going to be world champion, Simon. You can't you can't have chit chat, can we, you? We were focused. I think those days we were focused, yeah. We did good stuff as doubles. We did good stuff. Just the double fair as well, it was that. But it was very funny the day we found that out. It's quite hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. you mentioned that you mentioned as well doing rules with your brother. So was it? Is it a was it a natural progression? Just you just started doing rules at what sort of age and then carried on? Yeah, we're all we're always a bit of a creative pair. So whenever we started playing again, we tried to start to think how to improve it. Yeah, we started tweaking stuff. Time, there's no reason not to. There's no event we were going to where you had to stick to things so we very quickly started doodling around creating various bits of rules and then uh, Mark Bevis is a very good friend of mine who's micro Mark List for World yeah. War II uh, him and I started working on on bits of rules so all, th- all through I've been a bit of a game creator really and, and, and like to doing that kind of stuff mm. so and I, th- of, I, I think the blood of- I think though, although it's not obvious in in um, uh, there's a bit of a crossover there with your work life, is there? With the there is. Yeah. actually very funnily, I've, I've often uh, in my work life, people often said, "Why, why were you so in inverted commas pretty successful at what you did?" Did turn out all right for a little lad from Burnley. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've always said to all these people I've worked with in these things, it's actually my hobby. Yeah, I firmly believe it's my hobby. And I did an MBA at Europe's top business school, and I went through good university stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I think the thing that grounded me to be good at this that what I did as a career was all the reading all the thinking I'd done due to my war gaming actually it gave, yeah. me an, it gave me an edge in strategic thinking and options and risks and challenges that most people didn't have as 21 so yeah. I arrived work probably quite a few years ahead of most people who think about things like that so I, it's a um, bit of a disappointment for the people who run the best MBAs in Europe who think it's really val- <laughs> valuable for me to tell I think my little hobby is more valuable than their internationally acclaimed Master of Business Creation degree. But I think it's actually true. I think, uh, I think I learned a lot of things from all my reading of strategy and history and generals and leadership. And, and, I, and because I was really interested in that from an age of 10, you know, I, I'd, I'd read a lot about Napoleon, Rommel. You know. yeah. So I think that's really, really useful when you come to leading big organizations and making difficult decisions. It's really useful stuff. Yeah, I, th- I think um, the, the organisational skills that it gives you, and um, especially when you start younger, you, you you learn decision making very quickly. And I think it yeah. carries on in, in life because uh, you, you meet people who are afraid to make a decision about things. Whereas a war gamer, you're making tactical decisions, like you say, all the time. Uh, and you get in that mindset. Don't and you're you? doing risk assessment. And also you've learned very early to work on the basis of fact where you can find it, but deal with the fact deal with the fact that facts aren't always there. You know? So yeah. you get both those things going on, which is another 
true thing that's a skill for dealing with business is find as many facts out as you can but at the end of the day you still have to move things forward even if you can't yeah. find it so it's uh, you know going going back and being a student of history so you're trying to say well i want to build a set of napoleonic rules not saying i'll make them up on the spot what do we know about musketry you know you go back and you read everything <laughs> yeah. you can about. you've learned a lot you know you've learned some basis for making some decisions about things and then you go from there so i, I think it i think it does build i think we'll all be quite chuffed it builds quite a lot of qualities in people yeah. thinking quality yeah, I, think, uh, yeah. I think I think um, there's a, there's a business opportunity for a war games related um, business school there. I think. I think so. Yeah, yeah. You said they're, yeah, yeah. They're the ones who might sue with us. <laughs> 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 yeah, we might have to dodge that one. But maybe there is. Maybe we can go into competition. You see, come train as a war game. You'll be better in business. It, it's it'll be a hard sell, but uh, you you could be the man to do it. Turn up there. Well, well, that's great. Just, just before we move on to the next section, um, I'm just going to ask you what your what's your current project in wargaming, or are you, or are you tied up with the with the rules at the moment? No, no, I um, I have two things going on at the moment. One is for Meg, I'm doing some ten millimeter pacto armies. So yeah. I've really got quite quite liking this ten mil scale for big battles. Yeah, so that's working on some of the figures. Meg's basically finished. It's only a little bit of maintenance as it, as it now develops more publicity and growing it. And then it's the um, the World War Two rules that I've been working on many divisions of steel, which we can come back to a little bit later. But yeah, getting those ready to go, uh, a- aiming to get my part of that task finished with Mark by the end of June, and then they're off for production. And, uh, oh, fantastic! Like fantastic. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. That's a fan, that's a great introduction. We, we've learned quite a bit about Simon Hall there. Uh, so we're going to have a quick break now for the audience, and uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about big games. Okay, so we're back to uh, the second section, and our regular listeners will know that this is the the time that we talk about big games and. Uh, uh, there's lots of definitions of big games, as we found out over the previous seven episodes. Uh, so it's time to talk to Simon about his experience with the, the larger game. And uh, so if I say big game, Simon, what, what sort of um, vision does that conjure up for you? Uh, I, I tend to start from number of players, so something involving 10 or more players. But, yeah, <laughs> then it starts to feel big. Um and then, and then, amount of troops on the table to depend on the period, really, and, and what you're doing. I mean, we could play big games or the skirmish games, which still would only have moderate number of figures, like being maybe a few hundred in the skirmish mm. game individually. Most of my big games are big battle games, um, and uh, I mean, my my and the other thing I like to do with big games is try and give them a twist. And yeah, that's, that's another thing to do. It. So. Um, yeah, mainly mainly multiplayer. I mean, we, the ones we do here typically are twelve or fourteen players, six mm. or seven aside. Um, but I started the big game stuff years and years ago back in Burnley. So we did um, we, we famously did a battle of using tank battles in miniature years and years ago. We did D Day over a weekend on a thirty foot square judo mat. Yes, I, I heard about this on one of the other podcasts. That, that's uh... yeah. That is a yeah. monster of a game, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I think it was it was twenty players, and uh, and to scale because of the ground scale at thirty foot uh, thirty foot is ten kilometers by ten kilometers. See the entire Omaha beach is about eight, so so we were doing entirety of one of the beachfronts and ten kilometer depth in land from it. Um, so that was the first really big game I was involved in. I've still got a few, couple of photos, actually, in Divisions of Steel. There's a couple of black and white photographs. It was on the magazines. Oh, fantastic. And, uh, the war game. and you've got me and Mark Bevis in our youth on the photos ringed up. Back in <laughs> 1977, I think it was. 1977, all 172nd scale. Tanks, landing craft, all sorts of stuff. It was a hoot, you know. And was that laid out? Was that laid out on the floor, or was it tables? On the floor, there's no, no, on the floor, there's no way you could do it that big on tables. So we laid it all out on the judo mats. It was all on the floor. I, I have to say, that's something I've, I've, I've never done. Uh, is a floor game because uh, it's been, it's been suggested to me a couple of times with some of the naval stuff that we do, but. Uh, the, the thought of treading on... Did, did you get through the weekend yeah. without treading on something? No, of course not. No, there, were definitely, <laughs> there were definitely some breakages. Especially infantry, which you find a bit difficult to see when you're moving 
a bit too quickly. Yeah. Um, but people trod on a few things. There were a few casualties, but the uh, but uh, it was a pretty small percentage of what we were using. Um, and it was a shame. The only shame was, of course, a juba, and that's white, cream off white. And uh, they weren't too keen on the idea of spraying it green and putting spray. <laughs> We couldn't manage to dye it to the right colours, but other than that, it was pretty cool. It was just cool to have some, some big event like that. So, um, really enjoyed that. And then we did, um, we did then a one three hundredth one, which I, Mark and I then took over and organised a few. And the best one we did by far was in a church hall in Burnley, where there were internal telephones before the days of yeah. mobile things. So we we had teams of seven, with one commander in chief and six subs. And they, they, on the Friday night, they got to go into a room for a couple of hours before we went out for a drink to sit with the map and their commanders and do whatever they like for a couple of hours. Yeah. And then from then on, the two commander-in-chiefs were only allowed in their command room and all communications were over the internal telephones. Oh, that's fantastic. So we, actually, <laughs> so we have this fantastic system. And it, and it was such a memorable game. Uh, and it was another big one in terms of table. It was 24 by 18 foot table, one three hundred scale. So it yeah. was, a, it was a lot of stuff on the table. And it was really memorable because Mark and I had a little simple system with dice that we, whenever somebody made a call, mm. they had a certain amount of unknown time. We would literally cut them off. You know, we'd just put our fingers <laughs> on the off. We'd go behind them and go... <laughs> <laughs> So they're trying to get these messages across of the, the noise and the chaos and getting artificially cut off. And what was really memorable about it was that the the um, the two commanders took totally different approaches. The Russian commander took an approach of planning quite carefully the attack he wanted to do. And the yeah. German commander did a lot of planning but set up more of a communication system. Right. So that when, you, when you came online, you had codes for things that were very easy to agree. So that was H1, H2, so there was no confusion. Yeah. And it really was interesting to watch it evolve because on the first day, end of the first day, the Russians had made breakthroughs in all sorts of places, but he was gradually losing control and not knowing where his own surf was. And the German commander had a very good idea what was going on. And day two, they managed a fantastic counter-strike. And, uh, and there was a famous moment of one of the Russian commanders. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was a long line to be rang up and, and said, we need emergency artillery support now on the bridge. And we put him off. And there were three bridges. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a guy in the room just sitting there, sitting there with his map and three bridges, <laughs> and roughly where he thinks he, which ladder and bridge was that? And then he decided, thought, I, I'm sure it's the third one. Yeah. Okay. So he, he, and he picked the right one actually. As it he picked the right one. But in the time lag of him thinking about it all, the enemy had retired from the uh, mm. um, from the bridge, not having seen any artillery arrive. The guy got in all these trucks, and his entire infantry battalion was on the way over the bridge. <laughs> As the army level of Russian <laughs> artillery ended on the right bridge with the wrong troops, completely smashing up this Russian, this Russian infantry battalion almost entirely, taking it out. After which the Germans found out about it before the Russians did. Yeah. <laughs> which was funny. Communication. And the German counterattack of, of heavy tanks swamped through that area. So it was a brilliant. Uh, I'd love to redo some games like that. That was brilliant when you got all the com communication chaos going on. And, yeah, I, 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 I think I think the 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 bigger game with especially with the the large number of people, you get the opportunity to do things like that and set stuff up that um, you just can't do one one on one against yeah. it, somebody. We did a few of uh, the Meg ones. We've done a few. There's the one about a, a refight the siege of Malta, which is in yes, it's um, WSS magazine, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. That was a fun one to do because what we did as organisers, we set up the table with a, with a castle in the middle. And, and actually what's going to happen, if you're looking head on at the castle, there's a relief force going to come on from the left. But we wanted to disguise the fact this was ever going to happen and keep us surprised. So we set up the table with the, t with the um, fort in the centre and an equal space each side. It all looked very balanced and got them playing. And then we sent them out for lunch. And while they were out for lunch, we moved the furniture and extended the table on the left-hand side. So that, so when they came back, the table had got bigger on that side, yeah. and, the, and the relief force was on the edge of there, and it caught everybody, both sides. All, yeah. all 12 players were, didn't know what was going to happen, didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> there was a surprise arrival in the actual real, real refight, and we kept them away from the history. Yeah. And, uh, and it caught both sides out, so we just took one of the players and said, right, you hand over those troops now, and you're going to command this relief force that's appearing on the other side. But it was a hoot watching them come back in, and the eyes open up as oh. the table had grown. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? As you said, those are the sort of things that you put the effort in. You can, you, you can, uh, you can plan out. 
I've given a bit of character. Well, the guy who ran it, uh, Rob Sadler, did a brilliant job with the terrain and the figures. And actually got some sort of papyrusy type scrolls and wrote the orders like, for every commander in a wrapped up scroll. Oh, you know, fantastic. It's just a load of character. <laughs> and, and the figures... Are, the figures were awesome. Well, figures are awesome. This is where I go back to me being the chap they go to when they say, do you want to buy my clay? I, I, I've got them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, Rob needed to move them on, so I, uh, I bought them all. So they're all sitting down here. So I've got all these Ottomans and, and uh, early Renaissance period Christian troops. Oh, the table, fun. right? Next. They're rather lovely. <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned your weekend uh, games in Cape Town. So what what sort of size table and, and stuff are you doing on those? Uh, usually, usually we're probably putting three, four, six, seven, five. So we're probably doing sixteen by six mm. as a typical table size. I'd say that fits the room quite nicely. Um, We've done a few spun the other way, but 16 by 6 is probably the sort of classic size that we use yeah. for the big game. And then we've, uh, uh, we do Meg Ancients and Hail Caesar Ancients. They both seem to work for big game in a way, so we get a bit of both of those. Um, and then they do a lot of World War II games, so we'll do some big World War II games and things like that. Um, we've done some big refights of Rorke's Drift and stuff, one-to-one -one scale mm. for the Brits. And not quite one-to-one -one for the for Zulis, but not that far off. <laughs> not that. <laughs> get in there. Get in there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it looks, looks pretty spectacular. Um, and then we, so we did a Roman Gaul one was the first one when I came down here that we did. We did a really cracking one from the Crusade based around Castle Tiberius on Lake Galilee. Mm. And uh, a force there with, with two relief forces coming in, a castle in the centre and a massive Arabic force. That was a hoot. That was very, very good fun. One one thing that's come up quite quite sorry go on. We did Pavia. We did a refight of Pavia as well with the walled garden that was all floated. Oh, nice! That looks superb. Yeah. The black yeah. We we've 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 got a plan for Pavia here. We've got um, at the Leeds Royal Armouries. Um, they've got a huge Pavia set up with life size mod life size. Mm -hmm. Um, stuff with pikes and uh, and loads of armour from the period and the battle, um, and there's a lovely space just in front of that display. Um, and we've been, we've been friends with the Royal Armouries for twenty plus years, um, so um, there'll be a anniversary coming up um, in five years, four years time, won't there? Twenty twenty uh, twenty five. Um, so we're planning a big Pavia refight there in front of that uh, display, which will be pretty good, I think. Very good, yeah. Yeah, yeah looking awesome. forward to that one. Yeah, no, it looked, it, I've got some great photos of it because it looked really good with the walling all around it. Yeah. It was, uh, it's very good. The, the armories are fantastic, aren't they? There's a, there's a really good um, War of the Roses diorama now, isn't there, with all the Perry miniature ones, I think. In there. Yeah, that, that's that's moved in there. And and I have to say that they've been very good um, with with us as Leeds War Games Club since they moved into Leeds. Um, and we've done like war games demonstration days for them. And um, we put on our refight of Jutland there for the 100th anniversary five years ago, five years ago today as well. Yeah. Um, so it's been, it's been a great connection to have um, with them. Yeah. Very, very positive. Uh, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned um, the great man himself, Peter Gilder earlier on. Um, did you, did you, go up to the War Games Holiday Centre, which has been mentioned in virtually all the shows. Uh, and, uh, what, what, was, what, was, what was the reaction to that, and how did that affect your gaming career, do you think? Uh, we affected it quite a bit, because you used to drop into Burnley War Games Club every now and again as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, no, it affected it a lot, because that's probably where, seeing, probably where I saw big games for the first time outside of a show, really. And all those figure collections with the Napoleonics and the Grand Manor mm. rule set, which I saw at that time, um, it was a it was a huge effect on all of us, I think, because it was kind of he was kind of the inspiration of that at that time for yeah. biggish games. He was the yeah. big game inspiration, wasn't he? Mm. And uh, and it was a sort of epic thing to do as a kid to be able to go over there. Only went only managed to go over once, but just even to go visit it once and, and play a big Napoleonic game was was quite special. And you got yeah. Your I think I think everyone who's been there has a lifelong impression of of a walking in through the door and going, "Oh my god!" 
Sweet shop. Sweet shop, yeah. No, yeah, no, I'm one of the lo- lovely guys, well, except for his occasional coaching sweaters and a few things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's for that. Do you remember all these sweaters? He was really quite big on all these sweaters. <laughs> it seems to me, uh, and I don't think I'm wrong in this, um, that over recent years the big game has kind of drifted out of uh, a favour, if you like, and a lot of the new releases tend to be more skirmish related um, and yep. more yep. small gangs of figures fighting each other. Um, is that something you've noticed over the years? Yeah, I think I, I tend to agree. I think there's um, there's probably more growth in skirmish games than there has in big battle or main battle games, I would say, overall. Probably mm. because they're more accessible, aren't they? We don't have to paint up as many figures to get going. Um, so transition from that to, to the bigger battle stuff. And, and I think a, a lot of the uh, a lot of it also is that those tend to make the magazines and such things more than the, the big game stuff. Because a lot of, a lot of the big game stuff is done by... Um, quite committed groups of people who've been together for quite a long time who just enjoy doing it. Really. Yeah, I, I think there might be there might be a, there might be a double meaning to committed there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're locked away in the big game. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's it's something yeah. that it's something I, I sanatorium. That's the big quote. We're up in the big game sanatorium. That's it. Big game <laughs> sanatorium it. and business school. <laughs> No, we can with that now. We've got it cracked. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's it. Well, um, on, 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 yeah, on, on that on that note, and of our new business venture, uh, we, we shall uh, leave big games and move on to the quiz. On your holes, don't know who to fly with. <laughs> then why don't you go A up and away with Yorkshire Airlines? <laughs> Our Air Dorises will always give you the warmest of welcomes. Wipe my bloody feet! <laughs> Our flight crew are the very best. This is Captain Boycott speaking. During a flight, we'll be flying at whatever I tell like for as long as I'm bloody like, cos I'm captain, right? And your safety is our concern. Right, right you lot. Shut, shut up, belt up, up. And if you can't see the bloody exits, you must be bloody blind. Yorkshire Airlines, departing Leeds International Airstrip, touching down 20 minutes later at Leeds International Airstrip, because if it's outside Yorkshire, it's not worth bloody visiting. A Yorkshire quiz with the Lancaster. This would be entertaining. Yeah. Uh, yes, it certainly is. Well, this is this is the part of the show that the that the audience love and the guests um, are not particularly keen on. Um, it's the Yorkshire Gamer Quiz, and as normal, we have the little disclaimer at the start um, that this is a test of how Yorkshire gamer you are. It's there's no right and there's no wrong, as they tell the kids today. And um, disagree with me may not be the right answer or the wrong answer it just means you disagree with me and because i come from yorkshire obviously i'm right so there we go <laughs> okay. so it's a set of 20, 20 <laughs> yeah yeah it's a set of 20 quick fire questions and um it will either be one or the other or a yes and no answer there's no give me a three thousand word dissertation on um, Persian infantry tactics from the third century BC or anything like that. So, you mind you probably do all right on that one, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I would actually. It'd be okay on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. My friends doing the army list. What about them? Yeah, go for it. Come on. <laughs> go for it. So, question one um, Go big or go home? Go big. Go big. Uh, question two Contrast paints, are they great or are they a gimmick? They're a gimmick. A loaded question here. Paintbrushes, Windsor and Newton or Yorkshire made pro art? It's got to be Yorkshire made pro art, I think. Oh, he's doing well. He's doing well. Um, 
a controversial question, this one. Um, 96 figures, is that an army or a pipe block? Well, it's not even a pipe block, but we'll go for a pipe block. Oh, it's a small pipe block. That's all. If I could give you a bonus point, I'd give you a bonus point for that. Um, uh, six by four table, is that a big game or a small game? That's a small game. Oh, you're doing well so far. Um, points based army or historical order of battle? That's a tough, I'll go for historical order of battle because I like doing refights. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, when you're painting, do you use a, a wet palette to mix your paints or an old bit of MDF? It's plastic, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, to a piece of MDF, <laughs> special. Excellent. Slab of anything that works. Yeah. <laughs> I just think I just think wet palettes are growing cress. That's the only thing I think they're any good for. When you're painting figures, do you go black undercoat or white undercoat? Black undercoat. When you're offered a drink, will you take Yorkshire tea or a dirty mucky coffee? Dirty mucky coffee, I'm afraid. Oh. Have to go for that one. You might notice some bias in some of these questions. <laughs> I've spotted it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll be on his you see. Ah. The Yorkshire made paintbrush. <laughs> yeah, there, there might be some bias somewhere in these. I'm not quite sure. It's yeah. hidden away subtly, I think. You are uh, wearing a Bradford shirt. It's reasonable. I'm wearing a Bradford shirt as well, uh, which you, which might be, which will become relevant in a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, so, question 10. Uh, War Games units, do you like your figures tightly packed or socially distanced? Mm. Tightly packed. Tightly packed. You've got chance for a for a game. Uh, would you choose a two hour club game or a weekend monster game? Weekend monster game. Avocado. Is it just posh mussy peas? No. <laughs> Round dice. Are they allowed or banned? Banned. Banned, excellent. We've got a worldwide movement to ban round dice, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. With idea. <laughs> <laughs> Would you pay 33 pence for a communist? No. No. Do you like a, um, a good table in a set of rules, like a casualty table or a movement table? Uh, I'd rather have as few tables as possible. Few tables as possible. Um, 28 millimeter is king, yes or no? Yes, unpainted miniatures allowed on the table, yes or no? No, only one she won't survive it to take me to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, key question, key question, uh, Bradford City or Leeds United? Bradford City, oh, good lad, good lad. Um, and this, you're never going to get this one right. <laughs> you're never going to get this next one right. Um, Yorkshire or the other place over the hill? The other place over the hill every time, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Red Rose, sorry. Uh, we, 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 can have, we can have an argument about the war and you can apologise so later I'm on. Not, but... that a 19, then not 20, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, my friend, my friend Richard, who, who did the second episode, he's a Leeds United fan, and he said exactly the same thing. My quiz is only at nineteen because I can't say Bradford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And the final, final, yeah. final question, Simon. Uh, G W Games Workshop, are they the work of the devil? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, you've done very, you've done very well. Uh, three seventy-five percent. Which sounds yeah, pretty good. That might, is, the, might, might be like to it after all. Yeah, yeah. And, and considering that um, questions you got wrong were usually Lancashire like, Yorkshire related, you, you you've done all right there. <laughs> Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> well, that uh, I've just got my little little um, thing here, and that puts you in joint fourth place um, behind um, Richard Harris, who comes from Yorkshire and had a major advantage, um, and um, Von Ketteringham, who runs a YouTube channel, and um, his knowledge of Yorkshire was that he'd been to Leeds for a night out and had a really good kebab. So he was 
<laughs> he had lots of knowledge. And then um, the the other the other lad who got the same score as you uh, was a professor of medieval history. So you've done all right. Oh, there we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll go for that. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, Simon, that was great. Thank you for that. And uh, we're going to move on now uh, after a short break to our big topic. OK, a cracking effort from Simon there on the quiz. Uh, good fun had by all there, as, as usual, with that. And it's time to move on to our big topic. And um, we've got Simon on today to talk about his rule sets. And the first one that we're going to talk about is a, a rule set called Mortimer Glorium, um, which um, seems to be now known as Meg uh, across the world. Yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> Which I think I think that's nice because it's kind of if it's if it's popular enough to get itself a a little subtitle if you like then people are obviously enjoying it. Um, so for for those of the listeners who aren't aware what Meg is, um, just we'll go into some detail about some of the systems as we go along. But just what's a, kind of a brief outline of what Meg is and, and what it does? Uh, well, it's a main battle ancient game that's designed to cover the whole ancient and medieval period. So you can play anything from the uh, uh, the chariot wars all the way through to the pre firearms medievals. Yeah, and it's designed to be mainstream mainstream battles, are up. So uh, I'm getting people towards uh, uh, a reasonably full sized army. If you're playing 15 mil, it's a six by four. If you're playing in 28 mil, it'd be a table tennis table. Really. Yeah, full size. Um, and it was done. It, it was done with a few objectives. One was to I wanted to try and get as much historical feel as possible into the way the armies played, uh, while combining it with something that was very fun and playable. So yeah. those were the really yeah. two primary objectives. And, and in order to do that, came up with something a little bit unique that's not been seen before, basically, in the colour system that's used within it, which is a mm. sort of invention that's a bit different mm. to using standard D6 and other such things. Um, and it seems to have it seems to have caught the imagination of quite a lot of people who are telling me that it, it meets those objectives rather well. It's a, it's very very good at reenacting historical battles. Armies feel really good. Massive variety of armies. We've got 680 army lists for free on the website, so you can you can yeah. put anything in history. They're probably the best researched ever. There's a wonderful team I've managed to get as volunteers to join in the fun. Which has been They've done all of that for me, which is phenomenal. And uh, and. Players just tell me they really enjoy every game. Never a dull game. Always fun. Always really Ex good fun. Excellent. Uh, and just for, just again, just for the listeners, um, there's different sizes of game for Meg, isn't there? There's different uh, ways of playing the game, which is one of the things that I found really interesting. Um, so just tell us a bit about that, the different types yeah, of I games. I wanted to uh, both create a set of rules that would be really good for people who love ancient history and play already. But uh, one of my big theses to everybody is we're going to keep this hobby going mm. to bring as many blood in as possible. Yeah. And there are loads of, there are loads of sci-fi players out there and there are quite a lot of people interested in history. But the entry barrier to playing the type of war game we do is quite high. And you need figures and such things. So I thought, can I design a game where it can be played in, in different sizes so that the small one is easy to do, easy to get into? So the yeah. game is... Uh, with a game, I could structure it with three sizes of main game, which is called Pacto, small, Latin Magna, big, Maximus, biggest. So those three are in there. And then the Pacto one doesn't need actually very many figures in, in um, DBA, DBM pile on its 20 to 30 bases of figures, and you've got yourself an army, and the game plays really well at that. Mm. So if you go up to the big game, it's 60 to 100 bases, and then you can go beyond. And then having done that, I thought, brilliant, we can make the entry barrier zero. So in the book, I've printed three printed armies. So you can actually literally take that sheet, photocopy in colour, stick it on some card, take a scalpel and cut out, and you've got yourself an army to play. And the hope with all of that was to allow people to migrate into playing decent-sized ancient battles, get over the trauma of having to collect an army initially. And that, and that definitely has worked, because there's, a, there's a, quite a lot of people playing, I know, who've come from the sci-fi background, Mm. And I've managed to collect a pack to army and are really excited and enjoying that. And a few of them and I moving to Magna and moving up. So it was a very deliberate thing to try and make it easy access, really. People. And also different time periods. So if you're only meeting for an hour and a half, you can play a pack to a game. If you've got three, three hours, play a Maximus game. 
Mm. So, yeah, it, it, it was one of the things I I I, I enjoyed very much about the set, the the set of rules because something I've been banging on about during these podcasts is that we're, we're spending all this money not me personally but get, companies getting people into the hobby of, of historicals from sci-fi and we're we're only showing them this tiny little bit that matches what they're used to the 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 12 to 20 figures or 20 bases like you're saying for um for for, for the smaller version of meg um but we're not then going have a look over the fence. Here's something a, a little bit bigger. Uh, try yeah. that. And then once people are into that, then they can look over another fence. Oh, there's something bigger over there. Uh, so I very much I very much enjoyed that. And and are you getting are you, like you say, are you getting the feedback from that that people are no, getting very good up? feedback from it? There are there are I know there are people out there who started playing the game just with printed armies, just mm. to learn about it. So that's work. And there are lots of people now who've got the pack to armies with PSC. There are actually a lot of people saying, Messi saying, I bought a pack to army, I built the pack to army, and I've started, I've got another box. I'm going to try and make a Magna army now. So, you know, we are getting people coming through. And a lot of the people have names on the orders. They're not people I know. Um, yeah. they're, they're people playing other types of games. So yeah. it's certainly having some, it, it's growing the hobby rather than just stealing players from other rule sets, which is. Something I really wanted to try and do because I think the size of the ancient wargaming help me if we play our cards right. Oh, that's that, that's that's great. Really, is good news. Um, and it seems to have uh, well, it doesn't seem to. It has um, built up a, quite a decent community um, that I've noticed online. Um, yeah. And um, there is a um, a Meg specific podcast now that um, talks yeah. about. Rule uh, um, talks about armies uh, and, and building lists and stuff, um, and very active on social media as well. So that that's a, that's a positive. Uh, have, you, you, have you been part of that? Gro- well, you have been, but how have you been part of that growth? No, um, well, I was. I I suppose at the end of the day, I'm, I'm pretty accessible and pretty responsive as, mm-hmm. as a rule. Part of my philosophy, I think, if you're going to write these rules and put them out, you need to answer questions because the yeah. rule books have perfect so i've always believed in coming out and clarifying things or adding my two pennies to conversations where i can so i was mm. quite active on social media early um, and then it's just it's just nice that certain enthusiasts in various places have picked it up and got really excited about that and they're doing their own thing so there's about four or five blogs there's as you said the podcast which is led by a chap called ray duggins it's a good initiative um i've had nothing to do with those other than being told that they're doing it and then joining one of the that's it they're the pressing ahead with those we've mm. got um we've we've had the community in poland do a promotional video of meg <laughs> so you know it's it, 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 first of all, the game's got to be good if the game is good enough it will get people gradually because you yeah. get people who don't just say oh it's quite good they go no this is really good they want to mm. talk about it so that's the first thing that's been been working well it's been a, it's been a challenge obviously because it was launched right right when coronavirus hit. you know we, we, we exactly then mm. so all the word life stuff and all the face-to-face stuff we haven't had the benefit of yet that's all to come yeah so um it, it, it's uh it, it's done very well i think considering that it's got some pretty big followings out there and we and also we won a couple of good awards last year which is very nice yes so yeah it, it did which was which was excellent because i uh, from yeah. a, from a personal point of view um uh, this is the first time that we've spoken together but when i started to get interested in in meg um we had a couple of conversations online and and you were uh, looking at some of my figures and stuff uh, and that kind of thought oh yeah uh, you know that made me feel positive towards the rules as well so uh, uh Big tick in the in the in the, uh, in the box from from me there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's all about at the end of the day, it's all about community. Once you've got the game good, it's mm. about building community, community of interest, and having fun with this, isn't it? I mean, so yeah. I, I will support that any any way I can. You know, it's, mm. uh, it's exactly what we're getting out of our hobby. Mm. Uh, and the rules are good. The rules are finished. There's nothing that's going to change. They're they're as I think as good as I can make them, really. Mm. So we can have five years years of fun playing with them across all bits of history and using them for mm. competition events or small game events or big game events. Mm. It's, it's adaptable to any, and also it's adaptable as I've put a video up, it's adaptable to all sorts of basing systems as well. We've got people mm. playing it with single figure bases from all Warhammer ancient battles armies. We use saga figures down here quite a bit. <laughs> 
collected yeah. loads of them and the figures are beautiful, but uh, 28 mil, I don't know, they feel like about 35. I mean, they're enormous. They, they, so, they, they are big. They, they are big. They don't fit on bases. We, we, we play with those. There's a mechanism for playing and using those. Um, so it's just all about using it as a, as a system to have fun with. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned something there that's, that was my next question, and that was that was videos, because um, you, you've used those in the past um, to like explain rules and, and um, go through bits and pieces. Um, just explain that to, to us. Yeah, there's a, a. I mean, I've got a YouTube channel, so you can look up Triple C for <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Color Command and Combat System which is what the name of the system is, it's within Meg. Mm. If you go to that and find the channel on YouTube, there's, I think there's about 25 videos up there at the moment from me. And mm. we're just doing a new series, one a week, which are a little better shot than the original ones. Yeah. And um, about various bits of the rules and how to do them. And I'm, I'm going to be doing one shortly on uh, mastering block moves and stuff like yeah. that. So if people get some resources, there's, lo there's loads of resources there. Have a look. You can. See. We also do something called the Two Simon Show, myself and Simon yep. Elliott. To Simon Elliott, we've, we've got a thing where we pick a battle, talk about the history, talk about some of the hypotheses, and then refight it mm. uh, on a day. We, we've got three of those up there that we record, and then the next one of those is end of June. Mm. One on of June. So there's, there's quite a lot of audiovisual material. I think videos are great. I mean, they, they're, a, they're a huge help to everybody to see something. Mm. Yeah, I, I think um, just from a personal point of view, I found that extremely useful because I could go on. And and the, the the ones that go through the rules are relatively short. So if I've got ten minutes, I'll just say, all oh, right, let's have a look at this. Let's oh, this one's about shooting. Let's see how that works. And that that got me into all right. We'll buy these. So they, they certainly work for that. So if if anyone listening to this is interested in in having a look at the set of the rules, then it's all out there on the YouTube. The mechanisms and how it works, and as you say, historical refights as well. Um. So going pretty well, and you were having, if I remember correctly, there was competitions and meets and, and everything pre-COVID. Um, so uh, and obviously that ground to a halt. Um, did that same for a slam to a halt, yes. I mean, the UK had already got up to 20 events for a year, looking very nicely, and there were events planned in, in Greece and Belgium and France and Australia. In Poland, so all of those have got going, and then you know, COVID shut the whole thing down. So, you know, people have been playing a bit online using the tabletop simulator, a load of metal for that to play. And I think in the UK, this is just the last few weeks, and then people have to gather in groups of six and slay and a few mini events going on. But it won't really kick off properly until July, really. Yeah, and from July, there's quite a lot of things planned. So, there's a, there's so it's, it's, coming, but it's coming back to life then, it's better than that, I think. But, you probably feel it too. I think all the gamers out there are like cold springs at the moment. Yeah. They just want to get out and games with their friends. So there's this huge desire to just boing, get out there. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a, like a bunch of Zebedees we've got at the moment. We're all yeah. spring loaded and ready to <laughs> time for gaming. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> there's a, the first big one's Armageddon, it's called, I think, at James Hamilton's place at Battlefield Hobbies in Daventry. And I, I think there's already about 30 people signed up for that in July. Oh, fantastic. So it can go quickly. And we've 40-odd signed up for the London LGT already in September, which I should be at travel yeah. permitting. Um, so, yeah, the events will grow and kick off. And then people will see it face-to-face -face and all the – it starts to spread and they grow. And rule sets take about five years. I looked at past trajectory. take about five years to sort of reach the full potential. Mm. So we've probably had a uh, slower-than-average first couple of years due to COVID, but – so, it matter. so 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 these the, the the newer videos that are coming out then uh, is that like a reboot mm. to to sort of re-spark the interest now things are coming out of lockdown in places uh, it, it, yeah i'm timing it to come out of lockdown exactly exactly yeah. so we're trying to do quite a few things to just give everybody something to look at as we come out of lockdown and people get the chance to go out and play some games at clubs and stuff again and uh, and just get the community going again Excellent. Looking forward to it. Um, there's a, I'm not going to go into all of the rule systems because we'll be here, here for forever with it. Uh, but there are a couple of very interesting ones that um, I, I thought would be good to talk through. Uh, and, the, and the first one is, um, is the colour system that, and the card system that you use. Um, and, and better than me explaining it, as you, as you wrote it, um, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> what well, just just for the for, for the people listening, just explain how that system works. Okay. So, um, so about ten years ago, I was playing around with systems that were easy to remember, and mm. basically came up with the idea of color. We're, we're actually very good at dealing with color. Yeah. It's a uh, uh, even slightly colorblind people like me still mm. deal with color quite. Um, so I I wanted to get a system that could use that as a way of managing how you manage your troops and ideally how the outcomes are done in terms of combats and shooting and sort of thing. So I came up with a colour system which runs with five colours. Uh, they, they run in, in order from go black, white, and then like a traffic light, green, yellow, mm. red. In all situations, red is the best and black is the worst. Yeah. And there's a matching set of cards or discs that you use to activate your troops to do, mm. to do things with your troops. And there's a set of dice that you use for the, for the outcomes. So the idea of all of that was to try and get a system for the outcomes that have the right shape built onto the dice. So they're mm. not, not a gimmick. They're actually mm. a multi-purpose system altogether um, that was very easy to read off. So you don't have to revert to tables to yeah. look, look at the results. Yeah. Once you've decided you know which dice you roll, you just read the results straight of the dice. Mm. And the dice are very mm. simple in their, in their composition at, at heart because they've just got four symbols on them. They've got a blank. They've got a skull, which is kill an enemy base. You take a base off. They've got a, a, a cross sword and um, arrow, which is a wound, a half base. Mm. And there's an S, which stands for special effects. So the reason they're not, it's not just a gimmick of printing a six-sided dice is because it's got damage plus special effect on the same dice. Mm. And that's the twist that allows it to work really well as a system. And then you gradually grade the dice you roll depending on how good you are. So if you're a knight in the open charging fire, Fighting somebody in a loincloth, you can have red dice, and the other guy will have a black dice, and <laughs> you're doing two or three times as much damage as you. But you're looking for skills on the dice. The other reason of creating it was was a was a, a, a sort of attraction one. Of, of, I thought also if we're trying to bring people in from outside the hobby, wouldn't it be nice to have something that's visually interesting to bring people in? So we were trying the huddle, rolling d10 and doing calculations, or rolling yeah. d6 and doing calculations, not that engaging. Mm. If you pick up some of these dice, actually the sci-fi people tend to really look at them and go, wow, they're cool, you know. Yeah. What do we use those for? And they're, they're interested. Mm. So it was also to bring a bit of And the colour system then for the troops is you use the same colours to command them. So the general will have a set of coloured cards or discs, which are all printed on the rear so they match your tabletop, so they disappear yeah. on the tabletop. And those colours allow you to move your troops. And a red will allow you to do difficult things, and a black will allow you to do very little. So mm. you've got some command friction built in. And the general will have between two and five cards. So you get the combination of command capability, if you like, with the generals and the friction of trying to move more difficult troops, like a bunch of tribal goals versus <laughs> will do different things with the yeah. green card. Yeah. So, so it's all built around that, basically. So if you get a, if you uh, if you want to wheel a bunch of goals, um, you'll need a yellow or a red, two of the better colors. If you want to wheel a bunch of rooms, it's a green. So the colours actually give you the, the different flex. If you want to wield some skirmishes, it's actually a white. So the only thing you can do with a, with a black is upgrade it with a general once and go directly ahead. So if you draw a hand all of black, which is pretty rare, you, you will struggle. But there's a lot of nice characteristics in how it works from a statistical point of view, be, being a sort of analyzer yeah. of things, because the, the randomness in it is, A, quite a bit under your own control, it's not a random roll of a D6, you get three, one, you've had it. You actually choose the generals and their capabilities. So the odds of getting all black with five is really, really low. It mm. never really happen. Uh, if you choose to have all mediocre generals, you're on a lot of risk. But somehow mm. this feels kind of realistic. You're going to go to war with four Muppets in charge. <laughs> you're probably, yeah. probably uh, have uh, a few you might have a few problems, you know. So <laughs> it's more realistic. The other thing that's really important about it, before we go, it's also got a change in system. When I used to play... Mark and I used to play, we used to look back at battles and used to think, well, everything is going on simultaneously in a real battle. Mm. So we thought, you, you, ideally you want a system that allows you to capture some of that, mm. that simultaneous going on. And, and the normal thing to do in a game is, is you do everything and I sit here and I do yeah. everything and you sit there. And I, I've always thought, that's actually quite a long way from that. Actually. That's probably quite distant from it. So I thought, is there something I can get that's closer? And the colour system and the act that we have is interactive and gets closer to it. So a turn is shared. You don't have a turn. Mm. I don't have a turn. We have a shared turn. Yeah. And we each activate big blocks of troops in it. So it becomes closer, mm. the idea of simultaneous action, things going on, people reacting, people doing things, which I wanted to get into the games. Mm. So they've all got this interactive turn, which you share, which is quite novel as well. 
Yeah, I, I think um, one of the one of the advantages of the system that I've seen from um, I've been very limited in playing it as we discussed earlier on before we started it because of because of COVID. So it, it's been solo and just testing the rules. Um, but one of the things I've enjoyed with it is how um, the colour system makes you think and use your troops as they were. So if you've got a bunch of unruly gulls um, who are frothing, frothing at the mouth, shouting, kill the Romans, obviously in, in, in their own language, um, then if I'm if I'm here as a war gamer, in some sets of rules, I would I would go right. I want you to form uh, four ranks with a wedge to the left bias, with um, the armored troops at the front, and uh, I'd like to, you to charge exactly between those two bases of, uh, and the Gauls would just look at you and go, death, and oh. char <laughs> charge in a straight line or whatever's in front of them. <laughs> come back for people who played H War game, but there's a few inventions in there that allow it to have more character than most rules. Yeah. One is there are three levels of troop types, and that's allowed a wider range. There's drilled, mm. formed, and tribal. And that in itself, compared to two, makes a huge difference because you yeah. can make a lot more flex with that. So we make the Travels a lot worse. And, and actually, the best way to think of that is range from Greece, actually, because you get all three types. So you know your yeah. Spartan, who, who spent a lot of time training mili mm. military drills. Most city hoplites were something else. They weren't permanently <laughs> drilling. They were pulled together for a need, but they were yeah. trained. So we call them formed, and they're less agile. And then there were still others, which is just gathering, gatherings of men with hoplons and spears. <laughs> hoplites. <laughs> uh, so you get all three types in the army list, but that in itself gives a gives a really good different differentiating mm. feature. Um, and then there's a lot of characteristics in the in the rules. And there are there's um, one particular invention which is flexibles in the mm -hmm. rule set. You may have seen, yeah. Where uh, people always struggle with certain troop types and representing history because people sort of have the argument of our. Uh, it's always funny. Are, are, we're Roman auxilia, loose order or close order? Well, I have to tell you that in ancient Latin terms, they never yeah. had either of them. Yeah. loose order. This is, this is our invention of terminology. It doesn't mean yeah. anything to any of them. Yeah. Um, and actually, in our own terms, if you look at how they thought they could do either, basically, it's not close or loose. It's, it's does your fighting method depend on the person next to you? So is it in the box? Or are you free fighting as, a, as individuals in space? Mm. More the real thing of what's going on. Yeah. And your auxiliary could do both. They could be ordered to lock shields and stand close together and fight mm. just like the type of legionaries or head out in open formation and fight effectively in a, in a wood. Mm. So I invented the idea of flexible. So, well, some of these troops are not one or the other. That's, we got the mm. wrong debate. So we allow them to be adapted between them. And the same with Huns. Huns is a classic, you know, where they loose all the cavalry or, or skirmish guard. Actually, they used to spread out really wide and ride around in circles, shoot everybody. And then at the end, they'd all gather up quite close together and charge. Them. And so charge what's left. <laughs> so they were both. They yeah. were both. So, so this invention of flexibles has brought enormous character to a whole load of troop types in history that have mm. never been represented the world before. Yeah, and that that is some really interesting stuff, especially yeah. with some of the horse archer arms. Yeah, characteristics yeah. like shield cover, um, shoot and charge. The, the list we put a lot of things into it. I put a lot of things into it to give the armies feel. People will often say to me, "Look, these armies feel really interesting and very play very historically." And uh, we do a lot of refights. I do a lot of refights, and I'm also doing them with Simon in uh, with the two Simon show. Every refight we've done has worked really well. It's had a really historical feel to it. And you probably remember me saying earlier when I used to play in yeah. competitions, the rules we used to, I did one every Christmas and they never worked. I mean, <laughs> it's too abstracted. Yeah. They never worked for history. They worked like a funny game of chess. It didn't work for history. And yeah. since I'm history war game, really, that's my bias. Is I wanted to work really well for refights and, and these do. Every refight we've done, including Can I, which is the bane in most ancient war gamers, yeah. uh, the rules handle any amendments at all. So it, it works really, really well. And that, that, that's um, that's interesting because it brings me on to um, one of my other questions. Um, and um, ancient wargaming has been, uh, and you'll know this from 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 your time in competitions, um, it, it has been more of a points um, competition based era of wargaming. I don't think I'm I'm wrong in saying that. Um, but there are other 
hands up like myself who and you and yourself who play both who play the historical recreations of battles um so what what thoughts did you have and what did you try and put into the rules to make it work for both i think well i think you have to have both if you want it to really really work and, and the, but the thought process was quite simple it was there's only one job really first is get the rules to represent the history as well as you can and the feel as well as you can mm. then after that point it so you see what I mean? So don't mix, don't mix the two in your objectives. My objective is always to get the rules as good as they could be and the historical feel of armies as good as they could be. Mm. And it's just a matter of getting people to judge, starting to judge what's the worth of different things if you're going to play it as a supposedly equal game. Uh, and one of the things we did for that, which I was very passionate about, is we did that online, built into an army builder, so we could update it every year for a few years because you can't get them right. So yeah. you, can't, you can't guess them. They need crowd testing to figure out what the point is should be for something because you only learn through experience and upping and downing and the people out there will find the bargains see lots of bargains <laughs> so yeah, you, you, iterations. you can tell it you can tell in a competition can't you if, if you've got 10 people all with the same army all at the top of the table there's, a, there's an issue there is yeah and the good thing about the really good thing about meg from that point of view is the army diversity is huge the choice of armies doesn't affect who wins very much very interesting. Actually, the Paul um, Paul Cummings does an analysis of armies and players, and the, and the main success or failure thing is driven by players, not driven by. Players. And oh. on this uh, of the of the six hundred eighty armies, I could take at least six hundred of them to a competition and do fine. There's no there's yeah. the points are so well refined now. There's really no army bias. There's no killer armies. There's no even five killer armies. There's, you can choose anything you like. Mm. And what's good about that is if you like the history, people often say to me, what army should I go for? I go, what do you like? Yeah. <laughs> what you like? If you, you, know, you tell me you like Vikings, have a Viking army. Yeah. It'll be fun. Get something that interests you, you know? Don't, don't fret yeah. about whether it'll be good or not. It, it'll be good if you use it well. That's it. <laughs> Well, I think I think it's interesting that you you came at the rules from from that way round, um, because most of the, most of the people I've spoken to in the past um, would maybe um, think of of parameters like six by four, hundred figures aside, over in three hours, uh, and just stop there. Um, but you've kind of gone the other way around. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, well. Start. I mean, definitely started from the uh, from getting the historical feel as, as as good as possible, and then sort of the size thing. I very rapidly have gone for what we've done in there, which is I want multiple sizes. I, I just observe people generally are leaning to, on average, are leaning towards shorter, smaller games. So let's let accommodate that and allow it as a building mm. a building block for the bigger game. Yeah. So I wanted multiple size games. So they, so we're you know we're six by four, ten thousand points. For, Four by three, seven and a half thousand points. Three mm. by two, three and a half thousand points. So they have, you know, there's no one fixed one. There's, there's yeah. three there already, and most of our games down here have been about eighteen to twenty-five thousand points aside. So yeah, so that's, <laughs> well, that's what we well out of the range. Well, out of the range. So I mean, that bit doesn't matter. I mean, to me, the size of the table is merely the the convenience. Convenient size for the people organising a sticker board because yeah. that's all the pretty standard supply with That's about it. So <laughs> you know, we accommodated for that. Um, and the, the one, other, the one other area of the rules that I'd, I'd, I've picked out to have a little chat about more in detail is the pre-battle system. And um, I'm going to hold my hand up here and say normally. Um, I will see a pre-battle system in a set of rules, and I will just completely ignore it because um, I'm, I, as a non-competition gamer, as an historical refight gamer, I, I'm, I'm not one for moving trees around and stuff and setting a table up before the game. Um, but I, and, and I'll be honest and say, first time I read through Mortimer Glorium, I went, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. <laughs> but, the, but then I, I actually saw one of your videos and I went through it and I went, Actually, that's not a bad idea. So, just just tell it, talk us through that pre. <laughs> I'm flattered from a, from a Yorkshire and I'll take it as I praise. Not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for, for for those of us listening uh, who who haven't heard about this pre-battle system, uh, just talk us through that because I, I I did find it very interesting. Okay, so. 
So another thing I said to myself is, that if you look at battles, um, yes, there's a skill in running the battle once you fight mm. it. But actually, if you look at the great generals of the past, they did a hell of a lot of work in the build of the battle, fight it in the right place on the right terrain. Uh, it's a classic of history, take Wellington falling back to the Waterloo Ridge that he's seen four months before running mm. around. A lot of thought went into that before the battle. So I thought the problem is that takes time. So if you have the time to actually simulate that for a week before a game, you could do some interesting little mini campaign. But is there a way I can generate the same feel quickly? And I came up with this idea of, well, if we, had a, if we have a map to work on that's abstracted, that deals with the main features of ancient battlefield, which is, do they have, did they find a battlefield with secure flanks? Mm. Lots of battles were secured on a river or a mountain range or both or such things. So, the one axis is, do you manage to maneuver your opponent to a place with flanks to do it or not? And the other side was, do I maneuver them into a plain with no terrain? Or do I maneuver them into some dense territory where they have to fight in the Judaberg forest? Great. Something like that is, again, it's quick. It only lasts five minutes. Great. So that's what the pre-battle system is. Is it Basically, depending on how good your general is and how many cards you have, you start off positioning your army five days before the battle, you might say, for various reasons, we're fighting in uh, fighting a battle in Rome and we're in normal terrain. You say, right, I'm going to put it with a secure flank, secured on some mountains, and it's up there mm. with a lot of terrain. And then over the next five days, playing out a card which they just very quickly, the other general is trying to wheedle you out of there and get your army to move around and end up in somewhere which has not got a secure flank and has got Roman terrain. Let's say I'm a cavalry army, Carthage or Numidians. And it depends on the quality of the generals will be the numbers of cards that you have and, the, and then mm. play them out very simply in order. So it gives a feel for a better general with better scouting has a better chance mm. of fighting a battle <coughs> on a battlefield of their choice from the enemy's choice. Yeah. So if you, play, if you play Caesar with good scouting, legendary general with great scouting, um, he's probably going to have eight, nine cards to choose from, to choose his five to play. They, uh, Gallic general with very poor scouting might only have five. He's got no chance. Caesar, on average, is going to force yeah. them onto a battlefield of their of his preference on average. Uh, and that's that. The two things that, that I enjoyed about that were um, it's like a little mini campaign, if you like, before the game starts. So it, it gives a narrative to the game that you're going to play, rather than um, uh, here's my five thousand points or whatever. Um, let's just set up and play. You've you've got this you've got this picture in your mind, or almost the first hour of your movie before you move mm. on to the battle scene. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but but that it's it's not taking you an hour to do it. The, no, it's, the, it's, uh, it's a mini <laughs> campaign on speed. <laughs> yeah, mini yes. mini campaign in, in in ten minutes, which is, which is which is fantastic. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because it was um, it was something that I looked at. It was something that I didn't look at initially, and then went back and yeah, I went back and, and I went through it. Um, so I'm going through my list very nicely here. Um, and um, what was the what was the drive to um, do free army lists? Because that, that was a good one as well. Um, you can buy a set of rules for. 30, 40 quid or whatever, and then spend the rest of your life buying supplements and yeah. uh, and everything. And, but with Meg, you, you go online and I fancy doing a bit of Third Crusade. Type it in, bang, yeah. arm list comes up. No, exactly. I mean, I, I, I mean, the, the, when you're printing books, I mean, if you do something like Field of Glory series, there's one rule book and I can't remember how many follow-ups there were with mm. arm lists in them. Um, so, you know, commercially as a book creator, it, it's quite a good thing. But I always felt with the, the list that, A, you need them to play the game. Yeah, you can put your own together if you know a lot about history, but it's a big aid to people to have them to play the game. Uh, and the second thing is there another thing that's work in progress where the minute you print them, if you're not careful, the minute you print them, you want to change them. Because, uh, again, there's two ways you end up with killer armies. It's either a point system floor or yeah. this floor. Yeah. Either time you write either of those down in right, print them, and I know this from bitter experience. With the, with the, with the, you know, a week after you've printed them, you're going, damn. Huh? <laughs> I don't know, going to see loads of those. Yeah. So I didn't really want them that way because I was more interested in getting the balance between the rules, the list, and the points really good. Yeah. I wanted to be flexible. So I said, yeah. let's put them online. And if we have 100 lists online that cover most of history, we can adapt them over time with the points and get it mm. all right. And then 
Richard Jeffrey Cook and Nick Guy Krug and a few others took over and got really interested in the list and the thing blossomed and we've ended up with 600 and odd. So, um, so it's a great repository, but it's free there for anybody. And even if you don't play the rules, if you want to just think about a little bit of history of an army and look at what sort of composition would be, sitting, load, you can download them and have a look. They're well researched uh, and they'll, they'll stay free online <coughs> for everybody. So. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, it's an advantage I found with that was, is, is not necessarily because we're not army lists people here, but to go on and look at the proportion of troop types in a particular army, um, and Punic Wars is a big one here, so looking at the proportion of allies compared to your, your normal standard Roman legionaries, um, it, it, it's interesting um, to look at from an historical perspective, from, from a building an army when you're not necessarily building an army to a, a points value. Uh, and it also gives you the ready-made description in rule terms of an early uh, mid-Republican Roman legion and how they're in the rules. So it's all yeah. ready-made for people. So even if you're not using the point system, it's the repository for all of that. But it, it's, I, I'm very pleased with it, them all free online. I think it's, it's made it a fantastic you know, piece of work. And we're doing books, but we're doing books of a different type. We said, well, rather than doing an army list, it's actually pretty dull, actually. It's, it's raw material. It. let's do something more interesting let's do a book that contains some stuff about the armies but features a period of history so richard jeffrey cook wrote age of attila was the first mm. things. and there's another one the next was probably age of athens so they've been working. and they tell you more a bit of the history and the narrative of the hun the journey of attila and the final battles and ready-made refights and so it's a lot more than an army list book it's actually a it's actually a history book uh, it's history. It's my seventy years end. It's the history and the war gaming combined. It's, it's the book using Meg. So yeah, it's, they're, they're a good read and they're ready made refights. So the final question on Meg then. Um, we the people who listen to this uh, and myself included and and yourself to some extent are are, are big gamers. Um, so what what does what do you do when? Um, Pacto isn't big enough and uh, Magma isn't big enough and Maximus isn't big enough and you want to go to Super Mega Maximus on a massive yeah, table. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, very, it's very easy to do as a big play game because all you do is you make uh, each person playing a general. Yeah. Typically what you do on each side. And if the point sister, if you've gone way beyond the normal points, the normal levels of generals, just increase the number of cards for general by one or two, depending. So when we played the, the big game, the big multi game, I think we upped every card by one for the grade and everybody was a general. So each person will tend to have four four or five units, if you like, to, to play with as mm. a general. And then when it's your guy's turn, the rule is then that every player can do an action or pass to the side. So it's exactly the same. Mm. But once you've passed twice, it's a player out. So if your team of five, on version one, everybody makes something, on the next one, three do something and two pass. You're all still in the game. Yeah. The next time round, four do something. One of the guys who passed second pass, and he's now out. And you just play it away. So it's very simple, actually. You just play it out as simultaneous mm. <coughs> actions by each player. So rather than when you're playing solo, you might have three or four generals who do an action by one general. In the multiplayer game, you give them a general each, and every player does an action together. Mm. And actually, that's that game move even quicker as well across the table. So you yeah, because every, everyone's doing something, aren't they? At some stage, everybody, everybody's doing something exactly. Yeah. And then you can have some fun with the with some of the like the coordination things between people that we typically uh, ban people from talking across the table <laughs> from one end to the other in terms of debate. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so you can only debate with your neighbour what's to do on the well, table, but not the next one along. Right, yeah. So, that, so you, get, you get the Chinese whispers going around the so and so on the flag, <laughs> which you should be attacking by now, but it's not, oh, yeah, we need to. And then the, <clears throat> you can do things with like the floating commanders at the back. You can give them cards and they have to distribute them to the players at the start of every turn. And you say, we have to do that without any discussion with anyone. It's just yeah. the CNC's job to look at the battle as he sees it and distributes it. There's no and just, debating. Going, oh, I've got two cards here desperately. <laughs> you just have to do it. There's all sorts of little, little tweaks you can come up with that will actually, that yeah. will actually make that work, uh, work quite well. And, is, uh, it, is, it, is, it, is it expanded to a point where you need two decks of cards or is it, is it, is it, is it uh, stuck with the one? We, we, 
just about managed to cope with one. I think the biggest the biggest game, we only had four cards left in the pack, though, when we dealt them all out. So right. These are the only four that <laughs> spread out somewhere. But obviously, if, if it's a situation, it makes two cards packed together. It's dead simple. Just to just do a, a double card. So, although, if you've got the box set anyway, the companion box set, you've got a pack of cards and a set of discs. So you can yes. only give one set of cards inside the discs. Yeah. So you've actually got double companion packs in there. Mm. to you so you know we, we can do that quite easily <clears throat> and the other twist you can do which is quite good for which i'm planning for a refight later this year is you can mix cards in with them if you've got spare cards print a, print, a, print something or write something on the cards as an instruction and mix them in that's quite interesting <laughs> Oh, I'll be interested to see what comes of that because we we like uh, we like an event card and uh, uh, a random card within a, a card activation system. So that will be quite interesting to see. Yeah. So, so we we we've, I've got something like sort of uh, um, enemy hit unexpected difficult ground. So when somebody starts, you can play you can play that and actually reduce them to difficult ground speed. And oh, speed. I, I like that. I like that. Or another one in there is uh, assassination attempt on opposing general. Oh, brilliant! Together. Brilliant. So you, can, you can mix. That's one of the nice things about using a card deck. You can actually mix them in with interesting, different effects on there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a, a courageous leadership. One of your, one of your legionaries, one of your junior leaders stands up and leads the troops forcibly gain a plus one in the combat. You know, so you can, yeah. you can do some really fun things in a an yeah. event like that, which again represents history. You know, if you go to, you know, I think at Respina there was a very famous. Legionary of the Tenth Legion who stood up and took the lead, point just as you know, and had a big impact on the battle as an individual person. Can't remember his name, but yeah. been, yes. so you're representing something like that a little bit. Yeah? Oh no, that's how that, that 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 sounds very good. I, I like I like the sound of that. I like the sound yeah. of that. It's, it's easy to do. You just take a just write a few things on a separate set of cards and mix them in. Nobody knows they're there to live with, read them. <laughs> We've just got a little bit of time to talk about um, the, your other set of rules, um, uh, modern set of rules, and that's divisions of steel for World War II. Um, where, where are they in the in, in the process? Are they out? Are they in production? Or? No, they're not out. They were heavily disrupted by the whole COVID thing. So, yeah. um, I mean, not literally quite ill, but my wife being quite ill. So um, it's, it was delayed because of that. And it's difficult to launch another set while COVID was still running. Mm. Right. Uh, so um, they're largely finished. Uh, Mark and I have probably got a month's work to do to finalise the, the documents, and then they then they go off to the printers and they are supposed to be out for salute. So we should oh, brilliant! Those at salute. That's a World War Two main battle set. Um, again, it's it's designed to be heavily expandable to big games. So it's a two company plus bits, typically on a six by four. But we will we'll tend to play a battalion or so aside on a bigger table. So, yeah. so um, yeah. the, the main demo game at the end of the book is actually an engagement in Rory, which is a full battalion of the first Tyneside Scottish, plus some supports being attacked by the 9th SS, and then 9th and 2nd, I think, SS. So it's, it's a pretty decent sized game. You've got a full mm. battalion, I think we've got 24, 24 Panthers on the table. And oh, brilliant. The so, sort of stuff support. that we like. <laughs> In Stugs. So you refact that. That's a that's a nice game. And that's an eight. That's you can do it on an eight foot by eight foot table with ten mil, which is what we're doing. Yeah, that's a demo. So do it in one seventy second scale, something a bit bigger. It's quite fun. Uh, uh, excellent. And I think there's a there's a couple of videos out. Is there with some examples? Some examples just to give people a feel of it. I'm going to reshoot some new ones once we've got the rules through more final form. But yeah, there's a bit of a bit of a guide. It's um, I mean the color system, the activation. The joint turn works really, really well for, I and mean, works well for every period, but for World mm. War II, it's got a particularly nice characteristic because what, what I, all my reading of that, what you, what you find is the single biggest difference is high quality troops just tend to do a lot more in terms of anything in low quality troops. And the system represents that explicitly because you can repeat activate a unit if you get this good enough. So often you'll find really high quality say, some really high-quality German SS or some mm. very high-quality British paratroopers, mm. you'll get two or three activations out of a platoon, whereas your basic, just trained in the field, standard infantry, you might only get one out of. So it represents much more potently the difference. And, and it's a very real thing, knowing some number of friends in the military, and you, you look at a little SAS squad of five people, the amount of firepower they put down, because they're, they know what they're doing, 
the, yeah. the number of bullets going in the right di- direction is much, much higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> they just do a lot more they point, yeah. they point things in the right but it, it, you'll find it represents that really really well when you play it through and again it's it's fast moving uh, and it's fun we play a big game in an afternoon it's, it's the value the side you can do that in an afternoon excellent well I, 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 I certainly look forward to, to to seeing that when it comes out um any any other future projects in in the um oh. Uh, the, the triple C system is adaptable to every period. It's just about using the right additions to the basic principles. So with mm. ancients, it's all about block because you want mm. the feeling of giant block of troops deteriorates to unit, deteriorates to micro, so the evolving chaos. Um, so there's a set called Guard de Guerre, which is a Napoleonic set, which again is designed to play big games mm. to build the style. Uh, it's using Catarabra as a demo game for that. And that will also cover the Seven Years War with some a, a different QRS, so mm. to pick up the earlier period. Um, and then there is also a skirmish set of these rules where instead of activating a platoon or activating a block, you're activating based on the commanders mm. uh, on the skirmish set. So it's basically a platoon aside, and you're activating the lieutenants and the sergeants and the, and the corporals. Um, to get their troops to do various things. And that works really nicely as well. So mm. that's called Men of Steel. So that, that, that will be out fairly, fairly soon after. And then there's a fantasy supplement to make. It's, it's being worked on. Wow. So it's this, a standalone. Yeah. There's, pl- there's plenty going on. Um, do, do you find time to sleep? <laughs> no, you just about, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit too much of late with all of these health challenges and such things but I'm, I'm pleased to say i'm back to 100 percent fitness i was only a couple of months ago so i'm okay to get I mean, we had a very rough ride as a family we had, my wife had covid and was in hospital and i had an operation that went badly wrong and they were timed together so we had a bit of a nightmare four months with so we're only really just properly through that as of last month but now we are yeah we can we can press on with all these various things so it'll take a, it'll take a few years to get all of that out i think we'll, we'll have divisions of steel out this year and then I would think we'd have men of steel out year after. And the other one is the Renaissance set, which will be out early part of next year, probably Easter next yeah. year, I would think. Well, it's, it, 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 it's good to see you uh, up and fighting fit, um, because I did sort of follow uh, the problems that you had the back end of last year, wasn't it? So uh, it, it's great to see you up and up and running, uh, as we say, uh, and great to hear about lots of new projects in the future. That's always always a positive. Um, so we'll we, we've been going for a couple of hours, so it's probably time for us to to say goodbye to everyone. Um, but before we do that, um, I, you do get a chance to ask me a question uh, if you like. Um, have you have you got one? Oh, no, what's the, what's the biggest game you've ever put in? Oh, ah, is it, we're back to the division. What's big? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you, you, you the pick one. What's the biggest one? I think I think the biggest game. I, I think the bit. Oh, I'm, I'm just thinking now, which is big. We did, we did when when we were teenagers, early twenties. Um, we uh, friends with a guy whose dad made um, promotional videos for. Shell and, and people like that, big big companies, and he had a, um, a cinema that he would bring all these big wigs in to watch these promo films. Um, and when he wasn't doing that, we would clear the chairs away, um, do games. And I remember doing, uh, we did Waterloo in one to twenty. And I can't remember the size of the table, but it must have been must have been thirty foot. It must have been. It was absolutely huge. Um, and and I remember, and this is what I love about big games because you, you remember the friends that were there, you remember the laugh that you had, you remember sitting in the garden after the battle, drinking wine and and talking about the battle. And in this particular battle, it was going quite badly for the French. And um, Sean, the lad who was in charge of the French, decided that Napoleon needed to lead a charge. Um, of sort of the guard lancers to save the day because he was he was quite flamboyant and dramatic in that kind of way, and uh, of course uh, Napoleon got shot off his horse after about twenty yards. 
<laughs> and and the, the the morale of the French army collapsed, and it was it was a, a glorious victory for the for the British allies and Prussians. And in fact, I don't I don't think the Prussians had only just started to arrive um, when Napoleon got shot. So that's probably uh, my favourite game. We did we did um, Leipzig on a similar scale as well, um, and. Ooh. That was that was just epic. Uh, my my main memory of that was I was I think I was on the northern flank of the French, um, and we had to climb underneath the tables, and we made like this cubby hole where you could stand yeah. up, and that was Leipzig, and you were back to back with your your other players, and you, you didn't have a clue what was going on. You were fighting your sector. And then you'd be looking at, and there'd be like loads of Prussians coming from over. It's like, oh my god! And you look behind you, and there's loads of Austrians coming. And it's like, yeah. oh, so, yeah. so yeah, they're 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 my, they're my, and they're both probably thirty years ago now, but still yeah. stick in my memory. Still stick in my memory. Uh, so yeah, uh, excellent, excellent. I like that question. That's a good one. That's brought some back, brought back some good memories. Uh, well, thank you very much, Simon. It's been lovely talking to you today. <laughs> yeah. Lovely to catch up, and I'll uh, certainly when I'm over and visiting the folks in Lancashire and all this COVID stuff's gone, I must yeah. pop over and uh, we'll see if we can do a big game in Yarcher. That would be brilliant, mate. That would be brilliant. Uh, so thanks very much, Simon. Good night, mate. Cheers. All the best to you. Oh, what a cracking interview there with Simon. Uh, lovely guy. And uh, thanks very much to him for spending a couple of hours chatting away with me uh, about all things wargaming. Much, much appreciated. Uh, very interesting there that, um, that Simon uh, comes from the business world and uh, very much like Nick Skinner last week, uh, who does kind of business consultancy and uh, both of them agree in how the skills that are gained in wargaming very early on um, go forward in life and, and the, the decision making, the the risk um, assessment that people make, um, how that um, leads on to skills in later life um uh, so yeah very very interesting that also the uh, the business idea that me and simon have got for a war games uh, business school or potentially a war games asylum which uh, whichever way around you like to think of it um uh, but but a lovely lovely chat uh, uh with simon and um i just like once again to thank all the listeners um the podcast keeps growing and growing um another uh best first week with the uh, last uh, podcast which was with Nick Skinner that uh, broke the first week records again so um, lovely to see that lovely to see people coming on board great to have lots of uh, lovely positive comments uh, from people uh, and uh, discussions as well I'm quite happy to chat with anyone about uh, anything on the podcast they're not just about big 28 mil games they're about big games that everyone uh, can enjoy, different styles, different types. That's what we're here about. Uh, So that just leads me on to have a quick chat about the next episode. And um, I'm a little unsure whether I should um, mention this or not, because I'm taking a few risks with the next episode. Um, Number one... um, I am going for an outdoor broadcast uh, and I don't want you to get worried because I'm not going to leave Yorkshire for this. I am not going to go south of Yorkshire, uh, so, sorry, south of Sheffield. Um, what I am going to do is I'm going to travel down to sunny Doncaster and uh, I'm going to meet a chap, um, hopefully, um, next week uh, who uh, those of you of a similar age uh, will uh, will recognize the name and that name is Pete Morby now uh, Peter's been running a company called Elite Miniatures for a long time and if you're into your big games into your big Napoleonic games you will know those figures inside out because they are the classic classic big game Napoleon figure uh, Napoleonic figures uh, and Peter's been um, painting stuff for many many years and if you look in any uh, copy of uh, the war games magazines back in the day you'll see some of his figures and um, they've got a very definitive style um, which is absolutely lovely and 
absolutely synonymous with the big game. So, um, there's lots of things that could go wrong. Uh, obviously, I've got to travel down to Doncaster, uh, and then I'm recording the podcast in a, a different method to normal. Um, I've got a, a Zoom H1N a voice recorder, which has been recommended to me by a few people as a as a nice introductory voice recorder for doing podcasts. So, uh, I've got to get to get, make sure that the, the interview happens, get to Doncaster, make sure the recording happens, make sure I can um, transfer that recording into um, the computer and edit it into a podcast. So there's quite a lot of if, if buts and maybes there for the next episode. Um, so hopefully everything will go all right and I will see you uh, second week in July. Um, for sorry, no, it'll be the this will be on the fourth week of, uh, of June, won't it? It will be uh, the last Friday in June when uh, the next episode, episode nine, uh, will come out. Uh, so, I'll look forward to seeing you then. Sithy.